Hello, this is Dr. Christy Patton Lukes, a chemical engineering professor at Missouri S&T. This lesson is for our engineering economics course. We're going to be looking at cash flow diagrams and the time flow, time value of money. So a cash flow diagram, we will often abbreviate it as a CFD, uh, represents timings and approximate magnitudes of investments. When we start looking and trying to balance our cost estimates for our equipment and our operating costs, um, it's going to be very helpful to us if we look at these on a timeline. So we're going to do this where the x-axis will be time and the y-axis will represent magnitude. We're going to have, of course, both positive and negative investments. We have to spend money in order to make money. We're going to determine the direction or the sign of the cash flows based on what system we are considering. So here, for instance, is a case where you're going to borrow $20,000 to buy a car. You're going to make $400 payments every month for five years. The cash flow diagram for this depends on the point of view. So from the bank's point of view, they got rid of $20,000 suddenly, and they're waiting for me to make my payments every month for five years or 60 months of $400 each. From my point of view, I was given $20,000, so that's income, but every month I pay out $400 for 60 months. So the same information, just with a different point of view. We can, instead of doing a discrete cash flow diagram where I just simply show each annual or monthly payment, I can look at a cumulative cash flow diagram. In a cumulative cash flow diagram, you're looking at, say, the net amount. So from the bank's perspective, they loaned out $20,000. Then I made a payment of $400. So I still owe less than this. And every month I make a payment, we go up a little teeny amount, $400. And at some point, I've actually paid back all of the amount that was owed. And the rest of this is going to represent the interest. This is a cumulative cash flow diagram. A cash flow diagram is going to be a really handy way for organizing our thoughts when we're starting to look at complicated economic situations. So when the cash flows occur at different times, we're going to need to bring them to the same time period in order to do our computations. Now we can either bring them forward or backward in time, but it's just simply going to be important that we choose a moment in time and do all of our calculations based on that same moment. Now, we've done this a little bit using the SEPSI as a way of looking at how the value of things change over time. But here we're really going to be talking about cash, not like purchasing specifically equipment. So this money could be invested. Frequently, it's like if I'm not spending my money, I'm going to have it invested maybe in a stock account or something like that. So we're going to use interest rates. I'm going to be doing this predictively, so I'm not going to know exactly what that interest rate is going to be in most cases. But I'm going to use values that are typical for what my problem is. Typically, for maybe... Uh, if you've invested in an index fund or something like that, you're going to be able to make an annual average rate of maybe 7 to 8%. Okay? For industry, they may have higher standards. They may say that I don't want to invest in anything unless I can make 15%. And we'll be discussing that a bit more in the next chapter. But for the meantime, there will be an interest rate. It will be given... In real life, it's not given. You need to assume something. Like I say, 7 to 8% is not an unusual value unless you're investing 
your money in a savings account, then you can go with maybe a half percent interest rate. So you'll need to make a choice on that interest rate. So let's talk next about annuities. An annuity is a uniform series of equally spaced, equal value cash flows, like we talked about those car payments in the previous slides. At time zero, you maybe took out a loan, and then you begin making payments. The first payment is at the beginning of the first year or first time period. And we make these same things at the end of each different time period. The time begins at zero. The first payment begins at time one. Now, if I wanted to know what the future value of this would be, I would simply take the amount of this annuity, A, and I could take this and move this to the future, okay? And in this case, it would be N minus one years. And then this next payment would be N minus two years, and so forth, N minus three years, until I hit my very last payment, was, which does not need to be moved in time because it already is that final year. Now this turns out to be a geometric progression, and if you remember your math rules for all of these various infinite series, or um, this isn't an infinite series, just a series, um, this can actually be reduced algebraically so that we find that the future value of this is A times 1 plus that periodic interest rate to the nth power minus 1 over that periodic interest rate. Now if this is monthly, this interest rate needs to be based on a month. We frequently use discount factors as a shorthand for writing these sorts of expressions. We've already looked at, say, present to future value, and I could multiply by 1 plus i to the n power to get the future value, or I divide by 1 plus i to the n to get a present value. So we can write that as a discount factor. So the discount factor, I say p over f, meaning I'm going to get the present value by multiplying by the future value for a given interest rate and number of periods. And so this formula says it's 1 plus 1 plus i to the nth power. I can do this for any of these. But for instance, to go from an annuity to a present value, I'm going to use the discount factor P over A. I'm going to get the present value if I multiply by the annuity amount for the interest rate and number of periods here. And the formula says I'm going to multiply by 1 plus I to the nth power minus 1 over i times 1 plus i to the nth power. In your textbook, they have a table of these commonly used discount factors. So this is the symbol in this column, and the formula is in this column. The name is here. The name is going to be really useful, especially if you want to um, you can, on your own, look and see how you can program many of these things into, say, Excel or whatever other calculation program you're using. They frequently use these common names as the way to identify them in that program. But this is a list of formulas, and I think that this is something that probably you should have handy whenever you're working problems of this nature. So let's look at an example here. So here is a simple cash flow diagram. Um, these are years, so annual payments or you know income received. Uh, but here the nominal interest rate is 6% compounded monthly. And we want to know the present value for the cash flow diagram here. 
In this case, I have the nominal rate is 0 0.06, and it's compounded monthly, so 12 times per year. So R, the period rate, is the nominal rate over M, so 0 0.005. And if I wanted to know the effective rate, that's going to be 1.005 to the m power. So it's 6.168%. Okay? So we want to know what the present value is of all of this. And I can work this a couple of different ways. So I'm going to work this once, or show you the steps doing this using the effective interest rate. And if I want to know the present value, then first of all, this amount already is in the present value. And then I have this. This one has been one year into the future, so I want to bring it back to the past. So I'm going to take 1,000 divided by 1.06168, that effective interest rate. This one has been invested for two years into the future, or is paid two years into the future. So I'm going to do 1.06168 squared. And then I have this payment I make of $3,000. So minus 3,000 over 1 point, And that was not 2. That was a 3. That was a third power there. 1.06168 to the fourth power. And that's all of the payments I have. And so this is going to be $5,251.90. If you want to do this using the nominal rate, I'm going to have the similar sort of thing. The 5000 still was just $5,000. But now then, what I have to do is use the formula for monthly rates. And I'm just going to write this in. And we get exactly the same answer. So the technique doesn't matter. Just choose a technique that works for you. Now, the second question asks, what's the value at year seven for this cash flow diagram? This is easiest if you take your answer from the present value and move it forward seven years. That's the easy way. You also could choose to take each of these this direction, but this would be three years, this one four years, this one six years, and this one seven years, and you would be taking each amount to the future. That would be one approach to working this. We could use the present value and move it to the future seven years. I could do this using the effective interest rate, or I could do this using one plus 0 0.06 over 12 to the 12 times seven power. 
Either way, any of these ways I do this, I'm going to get the same answer. So often I see students that are kind of tense because they didn't do it the same way I did. There are so many different ways to get most of these answers. Don't let that worry you, okay? If you get the same answer by a very different technique, you were doing it okay, all right? If you're ever not sure, just be sure to come ask somebody so that maybe you know they can help you interpret what you did wrong. If you get a different answer, then your technique was wrong, okay? So just simply make sure that you have a way that reliably gets you the answer. And you may choose to do things that take more steps than somebody else, but if it reliably gets you the answer, then stay with that technique. Now, the final question here is what's the amount of an annuity that would be paid to have the same present value? So in this case, what I've got is I want to find the annuity based on the present value. So I'm going to multiply this by the formula for A over P. And so this is how I find that the discount factor sort of helps me figure out my thoughts. I want A, I have P, so I need to multiply by A and divide by P. That's my discount factor I'm going to use. So my present value, again, is at $5,251.90. Okay. The interest rate, okay, for my seven years is going to be, uh, the, 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 uh, 1.06168 to the seventh times 0 0.06168 all over 1.06168 to the seventh power minus one. And I get $946.50. Now, some people have interpreted this problem as meaning, oh, they wanted a monthly because it's compounded monthly. I'm just going to show you what that would be. If I'm doing this based on monthly, then it's still the same present value. Now notice this is, this is per year, what I did before. Now that I'm doing it for per month. So it's 1.005 is my monthly interest. I'm doing this for seven years. Seven times 12 is 84. I, uh, here, let me write it that way. Times 0 0.005 all over 1.005 to the seven times 12 minus one. And this gets me 76.72. But this is per month. Different answers because they are interpreting the problem in a different way. If I'm trying to make annual payments, this is the correct answer. So thank you very much. In our next lesson, we're going to look at one other type of special formula and look at some other examples.